So my name is David Lewis. For those of you I haven't met yet, I'm director of the senior executive program here at the London Business School. And my topic for this session is what do you do when you don't know what to do? So I've left the screen intentionally blank and something will come to me shortly, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, you've had, I hope, some really good sessions this morning. We're going to do something a bit different because really when we're, we're facing new challenges in this VUCA world, people have probably talked to you about the VUCA world, that volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous situations that we find ourselves in. It's how we interact and how we get stuck in and make a start that really makes a difference when we're uh, confronted with new complex, uncertain challenges. So we're going to do quite a lot of interactive uh, exercises to test our skills and see if we can come out with some of the basic uh, points that are going to help us to tackle those new, uncertain, complex situations. To get us going on this, we're going to do a little test. So I'm going to ask you just to grab one sheet this is a blank chessboard. I'll give you one there, so in a minute, just and pass it on. So you only need one. There you go. If you take one and pass it back, I put some. I'll send some down that way. And there you go. Send if you've got plenty of them. So you only need one, and you need a sharp pencil or pen with ink in it. Has everybody got access? We've got some spare pens. If anybody needs a pen or pencil, please raise your hand. OK, for this exercise, it helps if you orient your piece of paper the same way as on the board there, which means, I think, landscape, uh, because in a minute I'm going to show you a chess game in progress. So another picture with a chessboard with some pieces moved around as a game in progress. And your task, I'm going to show it to you for five seconds. Your task, you can't write anything down during those five seconds, okay? Your task is to remember what's there, and then it'll go blank, chessboard again, and I'll ask you to fill in as many of the pieces as you can. And then we're going to mark and see how well you, you've done. Okay? And you get a full mark if you've got the right piece of the right color on the right square of the right color. We can haggle over quarter marks and half marks. I tell you, it's not going to make a big difference anyway, so it doesn't matter. And just use a letter or whatever to symbolize the, the piece for you. Okay? So get ready, because your five seconds is coming up. Let's move this out of the way. OK, now uh, please uh, write down on your blank sheet as many of those pieces in the right place as you can. See a lot of pieces being written down there. This is very encouraging. Maybe it's an exceptional group. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is go back and show you the uh, board again. And this is um, self-marking, OK? So it's also a trust exercise, self-marking. Okay? <laughs> So there you go. So there's where the pieces were. So you can give yourself, say, a full mark if you've got it absolutely right. Haggle and negotiate with yourself and your conscience as to whether you want to give yourself a half, a quarter, or whatever. And then we'll see how you did. The marking normally doesn't take very long. <laughs> OK, we're going to go for it then. So, um, well, we'll start pessimistically then. And honesty is very important as well for learning. That's one of our principles here. Uh, anybody get zero? One. Thank you. One more. Two, two ones. Yep, great. 
Uh, two. So I've got about four of you. Three. That's seven, nine, eleven-ish. Four. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, six. Oops. Seven. I think that's one. Eight. Nine. Four. Ten. Anything higher? Did you get ten? Okay, excellent. All right, fantastic. So what this proves, which is very reassuring to me, who's going to be standing in front of you for the next uh, forty minutes or so, is that you're a normal group <laughs> of people. Okay. <laughs> Uh, with some outliers, which is also good because that means we just have a normal distribution. So the reason for doing this is this is we're replicating an experiment which was done in the 70s, but it was done with chess masters. So exactly the same thing. So we had a, a chessboard set up with a game in progress. The chess masters were marched into the room. They were given five seconds to look at the, the uh, board and then into an adjacent room where there was a, a board set up with all the pieces in the starting positions and told to replicate what they'd seen just for five seconds. Okay? How do you think the chess masters did? Absolutely, 100% right. Okay? They did the same thing that we've just done with a normal group of people as a control, and they came up with exactly this kind of distribution of sort of an average around five or so pieces. But so what? Okay, that's pretty much what we'd expect. But what was interesting about the experiment is they did it again with the chess masters. Only this time, instead of it being a chess game in progress, it was a chess board where a two-year-old had come in and kind of randomly moved the pieces around, thrown a couple away, eaten some. Uh, and there it was. And marched the chess masters in five seconds out into the next room, asked them to replicate the game. How do you think they did? exactly the same as we've just done here and exactly the same as the control group did. And the point about that is it's a fantastic demonstration of the experience bias. So when the rules of the game change, or the game itself has changed, past experience is no better than the novice or the amateur. That doesn't mean that common sense might have a role to play that doesn't mean there might be some tactics, like on this particular game, for example, you may have done memory you know, practice tactics, which might give you an advantage. But basically, expertise in chess counted for very little, well, no more than the average person. And yet, when we face new, uncertain, complex situations, we often think we're facing something we've seen before and start deploying our expertise to solve the problem. So the first thing we have to be aware of when we're facing new, uncertain, and complex situations is to recognize that this is something we don't know how to do. It might sound you know, blindingly obvious, but I'm sure we're all aware of colleagues around us who keep insisting on doing exactly the same thing against a pile of evidence suggesting it doesn't work. In fact, Maybe sometimes we've been guilty of that ourselves. So point number one, recognize we're facing a new situation and we cannot just throw our expertise into it. So there's the experience bias. So because we know a lot, we apply our knowledge to situations we know nothing about and assume our conclusions are valid. And uh, Peter Draco, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence, it is to act with yesterday's logic. Okay. We're going to look at another aspect of what's at play when we're looking at new, uncertain, complex situations. And to do this, I'm going to show you a video, short video. And I'm going to stop it every 60 seconds. It's only about four minutes, so we'll stop it about three times. And ask you to write down what it is you think you're seeing at the point that I stop it. Okay? Don't shout anything out, because I don't want you to influence the people around you. Just make a note. Uh, I'll stop it the first 60 seconds, we'll run it for another 60, I'll stop it again. If it's the same thing, that's fine, underline it or whatever. If you change your mind, that's fine too, and then we'll just run it to the end.
put the lights down, it should be good. So, yeah, thank you. Let's go. Okay, so don't shout anything out. So that's your first chance to take a view as to what it is you think you're seeing. And I will run it for another 60 seconds. Okay, so it might be the same thing, it might be something different, and we'll go again. Okay, so that's your final chance before we'll just run it to the end and see what we've got. Can we have that? No, thank you. Perfect. <laughs> okay. So.
Okay, so let me hear from some of you. So some of the ideas, what did you write down earlier on in the video? Shout out some ideas. Egg frying, okay. Anything different? Caramelizing hair. Pear. Pear, very thank you. I was worried for a minute, but yep. <laughs> Some kind of organism. Yeah. Embryo. Fish. Fish. Toffee, Toffee apple. Okay, so and there are probably more, some of which we probably don't want to hear. So, <laughs> and thank you for keeping quiet on that front. Um, so a range of very different things. So we're looking at exactly the same thing, but seeing different things. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this idea, uh, and it's called the uh, confirmation bias. Because what happens is once we think we know what we're looking at, we start emphasizing uh, and uh, overplaying confirming evidence, things that reinforce the idea we already have. But it's even more powerful and magic than that is that we fail to see things that undermine what it is that we think we're seeing. And even more magical than that, we make up things that we haven't seen and aren't there that should be there and believe we've seen them. Even in this example, those of you that uh, thought it might be an egg frying. So what happens in the morning? It's morning time or whenever you want, you want your fried egg. So you put the pan on, get the egg out, and if you're one of those people that does it with one hand, crack it on the side of the pan, open it up, in it goes. What will happen very quickly as that egg is frying? frying? It turns, white. turns white, thank you. The white goes white, as we say, okay. Did, so those of you who said that was a, a frying egg, was there any white? Yeah, well, now, this is interesting. <laughs> this is interesting. I have had people say, yes, there was white. There was white on the film. I said, uh, well, no, 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 there wasn't. I promise you there wasn't. Yes, no, there was definitely, definitely white there. Well, we won't do it now, but we can replay the film. There is no white, okay. But they were convinced this should be white, so they saw white. The other trick, though, which I think you're on the lines there, is... Uh, okay, there wasn't white, but I'll make an assumption to explain why there wasn't any white. And you know these strange people where some just like the white and some just like the yolk, so probably they'd done this little shuffling act, you know that you do, and most of it just ends on the floor, but you're trying to separate the white from the yolk, and it was only the yolk. So we'll just assume stuff to validate what we've uh, already assumed it is. So that is the power of confirming evidence. The beauty of it, of course, is that we all tend to see things slightly differently. And when we're collectively facing a new uncertain situation, complex situation, we don't know what to do. One of the best assets we've got is the fact that we see things differently. And if we can then harness that in some way to explore, challenge some of the assumptions, check exactly what was there, we have a much better chance. So that's the second point about when we don't know what to do, talk to people who think and see things differently to the way that you do, to break your own mindset or assumptions or self-imposed constraints. It doesn't mean it'll all work out beautifully because we're going to also disagree. So I have to talk about how does that work as well. Anyway, these points are really a warm-up for the main exercise that I want to do while we're together this morning, which is, again, to ask you the answer to a, a problem. Um, so I want you to imagine three doors. I'm going to draw them for you to make it easier. And behind two of the doors is a goat. So there are two goats. Okay? Behind one of the doors is a pot of gold. And the idea of this little game is that you want to win the pot of gold by picking the door that's got the pot of gold behind it. Because as puzzle master, and that's my role for the next 30 minutes, and I'm going to make the most of it. It doesn't happen to me very often. You can just call me master. I don't mind. <laughs> I'm going to ask you whether you want to open that door or a second question. But first of all, you have to pick a door. So there are, there are three doors, two goats. So, you know, you pick one. Say you pick that one. It's random. You don't know. It's a one in third chance. You don't know. You can't smell. You can't see. You can't hear anything. You've just got to, to guess. And by the way, if you value goats more than gold, 
just for the next 30 minutes, if you can just do a sort of paradigm shift and go with it, and you can go back to the world of goats afterwards. For now, gold is the thing we want. So you've picked your door. The puzzle master, that's me, opens one of the other doors. Let's say it's this one. And there is a goat smiling at you, saying, take me home. But no, we didn't want goats. And the puzzle master says, OK, there are now two doors left, the one you chose and the other one that hasn't yet been opened. You have a second decision to make, which is, do you want to stick with your original door, whichever one you chose, or do you want to switch to the other one that hasn't been opened? Okay, now it's your, it, it's your choice. As puzzle master, if you stick, I'll open the one that you originally chose. If you decide to go to the other one, I'll open that one, and you get whatever is in either case. No second chance on that. So can you just think individually, again, without shouting anything out, which of those strategies you would adopt? Would you stick or switch? So you have to make your mind up. Obviously, you're trying to win the gold. So you have a, you, you've got to have a strategy of some sort. OK, so if you would change to the other door, can you raise your hand, please? That's one. In fact, better still, can you come down to the front? And it is not a punishment. Please come down and join me at the front. It's very safe here. There are at least three hands went up. Yep. Anyone else who would change? So that means everyone else would stick, OK? Just to be very clear about this, that means you're all stickers, the rest of you sitting down. OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split you into groups, and I'll include you in, oh, there's four of you, fantastic. It's getting even better. Uh, and I'll spread you all around the group. So I'm going to split you into groups, probably about six or seven of you in each group. And your job in the group is going to be to come to an agreement, a complete consensus, on whether it is better to switch or stick, and why. So you have to agree on the same strategy, and you have to agree on the same rationale, and both have to be right. And of course, I will decide whether they are both right or not, OK? So that's going to be the task. And if you can't do it, I'll help, OK, as proceedings, because we do have to get to lunch, OK? So we'll see how it goes. So in terms of putting a group together, if I can just invite you to join here, and then I will ask, so that's five of you there, and maybe I'll ask you just to join this group, OK? So you'll be one group. And then if I invite you, sir, to join, so with the four of you and the two of you, yep, so you'll form another group, so you clear you're sure. joining those guys. So I've got, I think, two of you on, you're, you're not, yeah, OK. Um, so sorry, I left you out on the end there, didn't I? So if I take... Are you in the game? No. Uh, yeah, good. OK. So if I ask you all, you're not playing, all up until the lady in the white uh, cardigan can all be in one group and invite you to come and join them. And then I'm going to go with the three of you on the back row, the three of you on the end of the row there. And if you join that team, anybody who's not yet in a team, form a team with about five other colleagues. Can you do that? Self-organizing. And then I'm going to give you instructions. So everybody's got a team. OK, so you will notice that some teams, everybody's a sticker. Some teams, one person wants to switch. I'm going to give you five minutes. I have to have absolute consensus. Everyone in every team agrees on the strategy and the rationale. Where you go. OK, sorry to interrupt you, but I am disappointed to report that we, you stay in your groups, please. Sorry, stay in your groups. That we don't yet have, we don't yet have consensus, okay. which is surprising amongst such an intelligent group, because you did so well when I met you first thing this morning. So I'm going to ask you, if I have your attention for a minute, I'm going to ask you the question in a slightly different way. I'm going to ask you to imagine there were six doors. Whoa, yeah, well, exactly how I feel about it. Whoa. OK, and you can see where I'm going with this. There are, this time, five goats, and still, I'm afraid, only one pot of gold. And even five goats is not worth as much as a pot of gold. So we have to get the pot of gold. Same idea, you pick a door. 
whichever one it is. You, know, you don't know, so you're going to pick one. You pick one. The puzzle master does the same similar thing as last time, but this time, of course, opens four doors. So it's those four. And as before, each of those, you have got ditto, ditto, a goat staring at you. So same, we're now in the same position as we were before, except we started with six doors. Your job is to decide what's your best strategy. Is it to stick with the door that you selected in the first place or switch to the other one, and why? Don't shout anything out, carry, but carry on in your groups. I'll give you another three minutes or so and see whether this time, with that, with that further help, we can get consensus amongst this group. So can I have your attention? I'm going to give you some more help, OK? I would like a volunteer to come and play the game, to come on down and play the game. Who will come and play the game? We're going to do it for real. Don't be shy. Thank you. Do we have God? I'll tell you about that in a minute. Thank you so much for coming down. And what's your name, please? Ngozi. Ngozi. A big round of applause for Ngozi, please. Now we're going to play the game. Now, do you have, is there anyone at uh, home, anyone special in your, in your life? <laughs> yes. Yes, and what's their name? Uh, Gemini. Gemini. A lovely name. Now, I hope they're rooting for you because this is very important. <laughs> so we're going to ask you to play the game. So uh, I want you to really use your imagination. These six cups are six doors, and underneath five of them is a very small, tiny, invisible goat. Okay? <laughs> underneath one of them, representing a pot of gold at no expense spared by the London Business School is a yellow button, I think, bought at Bermondsey Market. And you can get them 100 for a penny. There you go. <laughs> so without rattling and sort of you know, testing, just tell me which one of these cups do you want to be your door? You pick, tell me which one you're going to pick. You can point to it, whichever one you want. You're going with that one. OK, so I'm going to put a little blue button on there so we know that that's your door. Now. The puzzle master, that's me, is now going to open. There's an invisible goat. Can you see under there? Just tell the audience. Yep, yep. one goat in, invisible goat. <laughs> another invisible goat. Yep, that's two. Yeah, and another one. And another one. Okay. Yeah, so there's four invisible goats here, ladies and gentlemen. So we've now got two cups, the one that you chose that has the blue button on the top and the other one. Would you like to stick with your original choice or do you want to switch to the other? I'll stick to my original choice. And you're absolutely sure of that, right? You don't want to ask the audience? Well, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think? What do you think? Why do you say stick? Why not? <laughs> okay. Why does anyone say stick? Because, because he knows where the goat is. Forget him for now. No, but uh, that's why he hasn't opened the one. It's no, the other one. Wants to give us a chance to. It. It's very stick. important. It's very important. No, They're saying stick. Are you going to stick? I'll stick. Okay, you'll stick. All right. So we're going to open here and we'll just see whether it's a pot of gold or a tiny invisible goat. <laughs> what is it? Tell the ladies and gentlemen. Goat. It's, an invi it's another invisible goat. Okay. Well, shall we check what's under the other one? Okay. The gold. The gold. Okay, right. Now, what does that mean? I don't know what that means, but I'll tell you what I'd like you to do is we have, again at no expense, spared, prepared a whole set of cups with little, some blue, some yellow buttons. I'm going to give each team a set of six cups with one button. I want you to play the game. Okay, so one of you has to be the puzzle master. The puzzle master has a very, very special skill. What is the special skill they have? They have to remember where they put the gold, because the whole <laughs> thing breaks down if you don't remember where you put the gold, OK? So as you lay the cups out, the puzzle master puts the gold down. Everybody else, of course, is hiding their eyes or looking away or whatever. And then one of you can play the game. Now, the point about this is play it many, many times. Please keep playing it and keep a track as to exactly what happens. So record the results and the implications of the results each time. And then we'll check in and see what's happening and see where that sheds any further light. So you can take that set to your team. Right, I'm going to. You can play your last round here, and then we'll collect the results.
This is the last game being played here. Stick or switch. We're all waiting on your team one. Switch. Okay, right. I, I need your results. What I need you to tell me from each group, I want to know how many times you played the game and how many times the, each strategy worked, okay? So if I start with the group, I'll call you group number one. We'll start with you. So what's your results? So when you stuck, how many times did you? And so everyone else needs to be working this out, by the way, because I'm coming around the room. I'm going to ask you this question. So when you stuck, how many times did you win? Uh, zero. Zero. And when you switched, so how many times did you play it? Uh, four. So we played it 10 times. We got zero out of five and four out of five. Well, hang on. We need to work that out then. So sorry. <laughs> we played 10 games. Yeah. And you got nothing. So that means there would have been five here. When you switched. So nine. Do you see what I mean? I need to know which, not what you did, but which strategy would have won. Do you get that? It's not what you did, it's which strategy would have won. Okay, so the, you're happy with that? These are your results then. Except you're missing one. So there was one here. You got one. You got one. That's, that's ten. Fine. They'll, they can debate that. Scoop at the back. Um, What's your data? Uh, so we started with Detroit twice, uh, but we didn't get the results. So that would have been two here. Yeah. And we switched uh, seven times. Yeah. We got the results of six times. So that, I think, is 8-1. Yeah, 8 one. OK. Uh, the group right at the back. Can I have your data? Thank you. I like the results like that. Just two, nu two numbers. Spot on. Brilliant. <laughs> Winning team already. Coming down to the front. Uh, we've got four and eight for switch. So who am I missing? Have I done yet? Uh, Is there another group at the front here? Have I? Oh, no, no, You're on the same group. And the... Uh, <laughs> no, I want to know if you... The, how many times the sticking strategy would have won? Yeah. Not whether you did it or not, but would have won. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so we played seven games. So that would be four, four three in favor of switch. Perfect. OK. Um, so what have I got? I've got 26, 34, 40, 44, I think, uh, versus 5, 9, 11, 12, 13. OK. So, can you raise your hand if you would stick? <laughs> <laughs> no. Nope. Okay. So we've got no. We've got no stickers. Okay. Um, why in the six cup version? Why in the six cup version? So first of all, top marks. That's consensus. Everybody now thinks they're going to switch. That's exactly what we're going for, and it is the right answer. Two, in terms of maximizing your chances of getting the gold. But by how much? So in other words, what's the rationale? So what are the probabilities? When you're faced with the two cups that are left, after we've started with six, what are the relative prob probabilities between the one you picked originally and the one that hasn't been opened? Anyone? So what's the... It doesn't. <laughs> nope. Yes. So is the, the original cup is a chance of one in six. The chance that it's in the other cup is five in six is the right answer. Now, some of you may say, yeah, we've got that. Some maybe you still want to process it. But we'll do that over lunch for those that want to uh, think about it even more. But what's really important to me about this is not the puzzle itself. Um, it's the process that we went through when basically, pretty much for everyone in the room, you were faced with a new uncertain complex situation that you hadn't seen before. And yet, within seconds, most of you, right back to where we started with the experience bias, thought, yes, I have. This is a simple problem. It's basically a two-door problem. And whenever you have two things and you don't know which one is which, it's 50-50. 
you know, I'm 27, I'm 43, I'm 59 and three quarters. It's been true for all my life that it's a two-door problem. What's the problem? Why is he making us do this? Let's play golf or do something else. We've, we've cracked it, okay? So we fall straight into that first challenge is recognizing in this fast-changing world that a lot more often than we think we are actually facing contexts and situations that we haven't faced before. And actually, they're the most interesting ones in terms of that is where we can start to create value, innovate, do things differently, uh, grow ourselves, grow our businesses, grow our teams, grow our communities, and so on. But you have to recognize that this is not what has gone before. So that, that's the first point. So another point about it is the process that we went through. So well, after I set you the exercise, you did it for five minutes, whatever, what was the second thing I did? Before we played with the cups. So we started with three doors. So I moved to six doors. I said, OK, we've asked the question one way. Let's ask it a slightly different way. It's the same problem. All I did was say, imagine six doors. Now what, and I heard the groaning or some reaction when I wrote up the six doors. For some people, just the fact that it's moved from three to six is enough for them to think, What's the chance that I get it right the first pick? It just doesn't feel as good. I don't know why. I don't know the maths or anything. But now I'm just less comfortable with this whole situation. So perhaps I'm more open, because I'm less comfortable, to think more about it and do something else. So reframing the question is another very powerful part when you're facing new situations. Keep asking the question, but ask it in different ways. Wandering around this exercise, on another occasion, I once heard one of the participants say, imagine there was an infinite number of doors. That is one of the best reframing questions I've ever heard, because you cannot have an infinite number of doors. But you can imagine there is a number of, uh, an infinite number of doors. And anybody who's into that kind of thing, instantly, what's your chance of getting it right first time? <coughs> what's the probability it must be in the other cup? It's one, and that's, that's it, just by asking the question in a, a completely different way. So that was the first thing we did, was we reframed the, the question. What was the next part of the process that really began to change? Yeah, we played the game. We played the game. So I am amazed at the amount of management teams, management boards, executive boards that I meet and work with who sit in panel, uh, oak-paneled boardrooms having intellectual debates about stuff they know nothing about <laughs> and making decisions. But they love it. Let's just stay in here and keep talking about it until somebody will say something like, do you know what? This reminds me of something that happened in 1977. And everybody says, oh, what? Well, the best thing was to switch. Great, we'll do that then. Okay. So talking it through without actually having any evidence. What we did there was we said, well, let's, let's see what happens. Let's try and have a bit more of a real understanding and experience of what this thing is. We can play with it. We can pilot it. We can experiment. Now, when we play it out the front here, it really doesn't matter to me whether the stick works or the switch works. Because there is a chance, of course, that stick will work. Because there's a one in six chance that you know, whoever comes down to play the game will pick the right cup. But so it doesn't matter because it's one data point. And this is the other thing we have to be very careful about when somebody says, I did this once before, and that was the right thing to do. Because it's just one data point. That's why I kept saying, play it and play it and play it as many times as possible. And some of you did more than others. I've had groups who play it once, and then they go back to the intellectual debate for the next 10 minutes. So they learn nothing, basically. And then, of course, we can collect some data. And that means you have to think again about what's going on. So I'm coming right up to the point at which I'm um, due to, to end this session. So I wanted to do something with you that's a little bit different in terms of it being practical and in engaging so that you can learn some different ways of accessing problems. So recognize you're facing something new and uncertain, but there's fantastic opportunity in it. Don't just ask the question one way. Ask it many ways. If in your midst there is somebody who disagrees, what should you do? Cherish them. Exactly. Don't turn on them as the village idiot. And if I could just explain it or shout loudly enough, they'll get it and be like us. They are the most important person in the group at that point of time, not because they're right. We don't know whether they're right. 
but because they disagree, and therefore we have to have a serious conversation. If everybody agrees, and it's a new, uncertain, complex situation that you haven't seen before, be very, very, very afraid, because you're just about probably to walk off a cliff holding hands, singing Kumbaya or something <laughs> like that. Okay? So find someone to, to, to disagree. And the other thing is about the different roles that are played. For some people, accessing the problem literally by being the puzzle master changes their whole relationship with the problem to some intellectual thing about trying to remember their stats from school or whatever. But just setting out those cups, I've seen it on people's faces, they set out the cups and they start shaking their head going, well, there's no way they're going to pick it right. Are they? I know where it is. These guys are all doing this. They have no idea where it is. And it just changes your whole sense of the unlikelihood that it's going to be in the... So again, when you think about some of the challenges and the changes you're going through, the more you can give people some access to touch and feel and smell and be part of what you're trying to make happen, the easier it is for them to engage, be open-minded, and learn new things. It's similar to what Costas is saying about you know, telling stories, making it emotional, even better, get people involved doing stuff. I'm overrunning now. There's so much more that comes out of these, these simple exercises. I hope it's given you some food for thought. Uh, enjoy your lunch, which is going to be in the E-Wing Lounge just upstairs. And for those of you who are coming back here, we start again, is it at um, 1, 1.45? Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.